Matthew chapter Matthew 7, chapter verse, 24, 7 verse 24 says, says Therefore, whoever therefore, he hears these sayings, sayings, sayings of mine and does them, and does them, them I will liken him to a wise, wise man who built his house, on the, house on the rock. Rain descended, the floods, descended, came, the floods the came, the winds blew, and, the winds blew, and, and beat on that, that house, that and house, and it did not fall where it was founded on the rock. On the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine does not do does not be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Precious Lamb of God, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, there's no other name above your name in heaven or on earth, O oh Lord. And we thank you today, God, that we can come to the throne of grace today and ask you, Lord, for your help. So, Father, I today submit myself before you, a willing vessel, God. And I ask you, Lord, to anoint my lips to preach and teach your word. Anoint the ears to hear it and the hearts to receive it. Master today, may you be mighty in this house. May your presence be strong. Saturate the people this morning, Lord. For truly, Lord, we can do nothing without you. But with you, all things are possible. So, Father, today, I pray if there's anyone in here, Lord, that has not made you the rock of their salvation, God, if they haven't made you the rock that they stand on, Lord, if they haven't put you before everything else, I pray today, God, that they would do it before they leave this house. Now, Father, I give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for what you're about to do. And it's in Jesus' mighty name. If somebody shout amen. Amen, amen. Praise God. One more hand clap for the Lord as you're being seated, please. Hallelujah. Well, let's talk a minute about Jesus here and and he gives a parable and he talks about the two houses here. And he also talks about two foundations and he talks about two men, doesn't he? Talks about several things right here. But in this text, Jesus is not only dividing the two houses, he's also uh, putting, a, I mean, not only is he, he dividing the two houses, but into two different categories, but he also divides the whole world into two classes of people. He gives you the first as which is the wise and the second which is the foolish. Now, Jesus is teaching us something here in this text, and what he's teaching is up to you to grab. But listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. Nobody is born with a desire to be foolish. Amen. When you're born, you don't have that desire to be foolish. And likewise, when you're born, you don't even have a desire to be wise at the moment. It's a choice that you make somewhere in life. You have to choose what you're going to be. Mm, somebody shout us a choice. I got to tell, I got to wake y'all up this morning. Tell your neighbor now, say, make the right choice. Now tell them again, say, don't be a fool. So make the right choice, amen. Even though this particular teaching is one of the, uh, one that has a lot of variables to it, there is somewhat a common denominator factoring, uh, factor here. And that same thing is the storm. At some point in life, storms will come to everybody. Nobody is excluded from the storms of life. We will go through and encounter some storms throughout this life. And so that being said, the really only one thing that this question is today about the storms of life is not why it comes. It's not even how it comes or where it comes. But it's when it's going to come. Because it's going to come. So you got to get ready because the wind will happen. Now, many of you have heard of a place out in the West called Tornado Alley. Anybody ever heard of Tornado Alley? Now, out in Tornado Alley, it's a place that people live. I don't know why you live in a place called Tornado Alley, but for some reason they're drawn there. Maybe it's the thrill of the storm. I don't know. But there's no question if the storm's going to come, and there's no, no question of what direction it comes from because it usually comes from the same way. That's why it's funneled into this place called the alley. Any of these things don't make a difference anyway. You're living in a place called Tornado Alley. So the only question here remains is, when's the tornado coming? You know it's coming. That's where you live. And the truth is, the question cannot be answered. It can only be answered that it's a predicted answer. Because no one on earth we know can dictate what the weather's going to do, can we? The weathermen try to predict it, but they don't get it right half the time. I think they called the state before and they asked them what's going on over there and then they dictate what's going on over here. That's, what my, that's my opinion on it. Uh, the, the weatherman is the only person I know that can be wrong and still get paid for their job. Come on, somebody. Uh-huh. Do you know in Russia, though, if you're wrong and you predict the weather, they find you? 
Amen. You didn't know that, did you? That's the truth right there. So the same is true of life. No one knows when the storm will come. And now that somebody has had the advantage, uh, some people when they go through a storm, they, it happens in the daylight hours. And sometimes when people go through the storm, it goes in the darkness, the darkness of uh, night. And sometimes when it's in the daytime, you can see the storm coming from way off, can't you? Mm. See, by being able to see it before it gets there, you're able to brace for it. You're able to, uh, to get out of the way out of it. You're able to, to put things away that need to be put out of the way. But, but unfortunately, there are those that are not able to see the storm coming. Maybe they went to bed too early and... Maybe it was a long summer day and they went to bed or a spring evening and they've, they've been in the yard working, spring cleaning, and they went to bed and, and just like they've done a thousand times before, they expected to wake up in the morning to the bright sunny sunshine and on the, the birds chirping and all these things, but instead they woke up to the sound of a tornado ripping their house apart. It was a tornado that was destroying everything they held dear to their lives, their families, uh, heirlooms, their property, even life was ripped away from them. In the morning light, all that remains are broken, shattered pieces of life. A life that used to be, or a home that used to be welcoming to some. See, it may have happened in the dark, and when we wake up, there is a, a marriage that used to be beautiful and happy, but now it's been destroyed. Uh, there's a body that used to be healthy and strong, and now it's weak and feeble. There's a family that used to be close and knit together. They used to love each other, but now they're destroyed. There's a mind that used to be clear, sharp, uncluttered by drugs and alcohol, but it's crept in in the midnight hour, a retirement plan that used to exist, but it's got blown away by the storm. Car that used to be beautiful is just now blown out to nothing. Dreams and aspirations of things to come have suddenly been destroyed. It all happened without any warning. It happened in the midnight. We didn't even see it coming. It happened while they were sleeping. See, I wonder how many storms could be avoided if we hadn't been sleeping. Uh, see, now I know some storms are unavoidable, they're just going to happen. But there are some storms that should have been, and there, there are some storms that could have been avoided if we would just wake up. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. <laughs> see, you got to understand something, beloved. All marriages don't have to end in divorce. All physical attacks on the body don't have to lead to a sickness, and they don't have to lead to heart attack or stroke or cancer or diabetes. A lot of things that happen in our lives are simply because we were asleep. It's because we were not watching to see the storm coming. Beloved, we're not paying attention to what's happening right before us sometimes. Let's look at Samson and Delilah for a minute. Judges 16, 19, and 21 it says, And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord had, uh, was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Got to understand something. Samson didn't have to have his eyes put out. He didn't have to suffer humiliation and play the part of a fool. He didn't even have to be a slave to the Philistine prison. But let me tell you what happened. There was a storm that he could have avoided. But the problem was he was sleeping when he thought everything was all right. Mm. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. Ah. Uh. Let me tell you, you might have been, I mean, he might have been sleeping when he should have been reading the Word of God. And, and I said that you might have been, I mean, he, he might have been sleeping when he should have been in church listening to the Word of God being preached. We should have been taking notes instead of looking at our phone. We should have been preparing ourselves a firm foundation. Yes, Samson was sleeping while the storm was brewing right before his eyes. Samson had closed his eyes to the obvious threat that was around him. Samson pretended everything was all right. He was going after his own lustful thoughts and his own ways, and, and yet you were pretending that everything was, was and is all right. You, just like Samson, me, just like Samson, knew in our heart that it was all wrong. Uh, I'm preaching to somebody today. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church today. 
I know there's some storms that are unavoidable, unavoidable, but let me tell you this. There are storms that you don't have to go through if you just open your eyes and look what's right happening in front of you. Some of you today are in a storm right now that you do not have to go through and didn't have to take your family through. You're going through hell that you didn't have to walk through. You're experiencing heartbreak that you didn't have to experience. And you're drowning in a sea that seems to be a bottomless pit and you didn't have to be in it to start with. There are storms that are a product and the fruit of our own fleshly desires and decisions. And the only reason it happened was because of the decision you made. Samson's life was a series of storms. And there was a lot of tragedies throughout his life. He suffered a, suffered a lot of a great loss and he had heartbreak, but yet every one of them was a product of his own self-will. It was a product of his own actions, his actions that birthed out his fleshly desires. And when our flesh overcomes our spirit, man, there's a storm about to brew. We've all been there. Nobody can point a self-righteous finger at somebody else without having three of them pointed back at you. Amen, Pastor. We've all blown it at some point in life. We've all moved in the flesh, even though the Spirit was telling us not to. But we all fell asleep at some point when we should have been awake. And like Samson, we found ourselves right in the middle of the storm. But the storms that the text is talking about is not necessarily that type of storm. The storms the text is talking about is an unforeseeable storm, a, a supernatural storm. Listen to me for a minute. An unavoidable storm. The storm is, is not the consequence of a bad or selfish decision making. No. This storm is a product of satanic conspiracy. Listen to me. It is designed to destroy your faith and to take you out. It's a fiery furnace. Uh, this furnace has been designed, formed, and created since the beginning of time. And it was designed for the sole purpose of destroying you and your life. Look at Nebuchadnezzar for just a minute. The fiery furnace was supposed to prove publicly that the faith of the three Hebrew children was worthless. Not to put your faith in their God. It was the king's intention to humiliate the testimony in the public setting and the confession of these three young men, uh, their faith that it was worthless. That's the purpose of the storm that I want to talk to you about today. That's the reason that it comes. It comes to humiliate you. It comes to ridicule you. And it comes to destroy your faith in God. And it comes to put you on display to the world to say that you couldn't make it and they won't make it either. It comes and says, just like I destroyed you, I'll destroy them too. It comes in to do some things. Beloved, we better wake up to it. Because it'll creep in before you know it. The sad truth is there are many churches that have been blown away by the storms and have fallen. And Jesus tells us why. Because they built their house on the sand. Mm. What are we building our house on today? What are we building our house on today? Pastors getting strayed this way and that way every day trying to fit into the world system. You got an AG church right now. They just got kicked out. Praise God. They got kicked out. If they didn't get kicked out, they should have got kicked out. But they resigned because they were speaking that the, the lesbians can come in and the homosexuals come in and preach from the pulpit. Let me tell you something. They should have been kicked out. I don't care who's watching. They should have been kicked out. The word of God is clear about it. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Oh, Lord. Let me, we ain't like that, are we? Come on, somebody. Give me praise. God's a good God and he's faithful to us. And when I read stuff like that, it upsets my spirit. Because there's people that are backing and supporting this. Jesus help us. People go to church on Sunday and Wednesday and they hear the, the preacher pour his heart out. and they, they shout with the best of them. They dance in the spirit. They talk in tongues. They pay their tithes. Some of them have even preached before. But they lack one important thing. They did not build their house on a firm foundation. But they built their house on the sand. And let me tell you something. Anytime you build your house on the sand, it will not stand. It will come down. The sand means uh, just on the surface. you got to understand something. Sand is always moving and shifting. It's changing. It's unstable. They built their house on religious efforts and mindsets. 
Ah, uh, they built their house on the good deeds and their, their uh, financial resources. They built their house on uh, morality and legal righteousness, righteousness, and they built their own wisdom and knowledge instead of the Father. And all these things are but sand moving and shifting with the tide that's around us right now. No wonder the person that wrote the song said, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is but sinking sand. It's no mystery that when someone falls, regardless of how big or, or beautiful the house is or how big or beautiful the ministry is, it doesn't matter regardless of that. Jesus reveals that when the house is destroyed in the storm, it is always a foundational problem. Everything is dependent upon your foundation. Ah, uh, I'm a contractor. It starts with the foundation. If the foundation isn't any good, the house will fall. Beloved, this is where so many people miss the mark. They want to build something that they can be proud of that will impress others. Ah, uh, They want the anointing and they want to minister. They want to preach and they, they want to teach. They want to sing and evangelize. They want the big house and the fancy cars. They want the big reputation and the popularity. And they put all of their energy into what they can see and they fail to build a strong foundation. Luke 6, 47, 48 said, Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation of the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house. When the storm came, it could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. In other words, the wise man understands that the most necessary thing in his house is the foundation. The wise man is more concerned with what others can't see than what they can see. We've got to look at Jesus for a minute. Jesus spent 30 years of his life laying a foundation for a three-and-a-half-year ministry. Oh, yeah. We know about the birth of Jesus. We read about it all the time. It's in our text. We tell stories about it. We sing songs about it. We even see him at the age of 12 years old ministering in the temple. But we know nothing of his life from the birth up to he was 12. And we know nothing of his life after 12 years old until he starts his ministry at the age of 30. What was Jesus doing in all these years he was building? He was laying a foundation for you and I. He was laying a foundation for his ministry. Jesus was teaching us how to build our lives. Matthew 6, 1 and 8 says, Take heed that ye do not uh, your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But, but when thou doest alms, let, them, uh, let thy not the left hand know what thy right hand doeth, and, and that thy alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard uh, for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask of him. He taught us right here to do our praying in a secret closet. He said to do your alms between ourselves and God. He said to fast secretly unto the Lord, not seeking attention from others. This is the foundation of life. Because he says when you've done these things secretly, uh, your Father and God, your Father God will reward you openly. See, you got to understand something. The wise man, he tries to dig down deep. The wise man is willing to invest time and effort in building a good foundation. And Jesus reveals the reason one man's house was destroyed by the storm and the other was not was because of the foundation. Laying the foundation for a successful life, though, is hard work. It takes time and dedication unto the Lord. you got to understand anybody can walk in here and shout. Oh, anybody can come in here and lift their hands up. Anybody can come in here and dance and, and run around the, the sanctuary and speak in tongues. And, and it's a smooth surface. They can do all these things. 
Mm. But it's hard sometimes to shout and dance and to run and to holler and give God praise when you're digging and you're hitting rocks and roots and getting things out of the way that are unstable and undependable, things that are trying to shift the house off of the foundation. Sometimes we got to keep digging a little bit deeper and say, I don't care how many roots that I hit, and I don't care about how many rocks I got to throw out of the way. I got to get down to a firm foundation. Ah, the wise man digs down deep. You have to dig past your feelings sometimes. You got to dig past your emotions sometimes. You got to dig past popular opinion and past the religious mindset. Dig past your own head knowledge. We have to dig sometimes past even secondhand revelation. In other words, you can't build your life on who everyone says, says Jesus is. And what the word says. And that's what you see going on all across this world right now. You've got to know him for yourself and have a relationship with him for yourself. And you got to be able to know you are standing on the rock. There are storms in lives that will be unavoidable. And there are storms that will take us by surprise. And there are storms that are supernatural in design and origin. But the revelation that Jesus brings to us is this. If the house has the right foundation, it will still be standing when the storm is over. I'm telling you right now, somebody tell your neighbor, say, I've had my share of storms, but I'm still standing. Ah. You here this morning because you have weathered some storms, beloved. You are here this morning because you've been building your foundation. You've been standing on your foundation. You may see me up here this morning, and by the appearance of things, it looks like I got it all together. But let me tell you something. Uh, don't let the looks deceive you. Uh, don't let them think you uh, let them deceive you in thinking I ain't never walked through a storm before. You hear me? Listen to me for a minute. I'm trying to speak words of encouragement to your life and blessing, but, but I'm trying to tell you this right here too. If you don't build your house on a rock, you're going to get swept away. That doesn't mean that I haven't never been swept away. I don't have time today to talk about all the storms that I've had to walk through and all the tears that I've shed, but, but I've come in here and I've avoided some and some I couldn't avoid. But, but today's the message I want to get to you today is this right here, I'm still standing today. Ah, tell your neighbor, say, I'm still standing. See, the enemy might throw some punches at you just like he threw at me, and we may take a blow every now and then, and we may take some good licks from him and might even take an uppercut or two that'll knock me down. But let me tell you something, as long as I bounce back up and get on the firm foundation, I'm still standing today. I had a bad storm in my life, but I'm standing today. It may have tore everything up around me. It may have took everything out of my life, but I'm still standing today. There were some things that I thought I couldn't live without, but they got removed out of my life and I was still standing on the foundation today I did not get moved by the sand this way or that way but I stayed firm because I kept digging and I knew that if I kept digging I'd hit the rock and I'd be on the foundation of Jesus Christ let me tell you something today you better get off of the sand and get on to the rock it's only going to be by the rock that you're going to stand beloved Ah, there's been people blown out of my life that I thought were friends, but I'm still standing. I didn't need them anyway. Sometimes I felt like the storm would never end, but I was still standing in the end. Let me tell you something today. You've got to understand where your foundation is. You want to see your children grow up in the Lord, have a firm foundation for them. Ah, how do you do it? How do you survive? When we've seen so many others fall, Seen others that didn't make it. How do you make it through a storm of sickness? And how do you make it through a storm of loss of a loved one? How do you make it through broken relationships or, or through the storm of divorce or heartbreak, the, the storm of financial disaster? How do you make it even when everything you have is taken away? How do you make it when you have to sell everything to survive? Been there. So many people give up along the way and so many people fall and quit. And the secret right here, beloved, is this right here. you got to find the rock. you got to be willing to dig past everything and everybody else. Dig past churches and church mindset. Dig past religion and religious mindset. Dig past your emotions and your feelings. Dig past opinions. And I promise you, if you'll keep on digging, that shovel's going to hear a clang. 
and it's going to be on the rock. And somebody needs to know right now, you're digging right now. And you said, but Pastor, I'm five foot deep, and I still ain't hit the rock. Keep on digging, because I promise you, there's somewhere down there that's going to be a rock. Oh, let me tell you something. I used to run front, run front loader equipment and track holes and all that, and eventually at some point, I hit rock. Uh, and I always say, I say, how deep, how deep do you want me to go? And they say, till you hit rock, till you can't go no further. And let me tell you, every hole I ever dug, I went to the rock. Every time it went down to the rock. I've weathered storms before, and I've felt the rain that has poured on my life. I've heard the thunder roll, and I've seen the lightning flash before my eyes. I've felt the hand of fear, and it's tried to grip my heart every now and then. But I kept on digging, and finally, I kept digging even when I was in the miry clay because he said he put my feet on a rock to stay. Somebody needs to know you're about to hit rock this morning. you just on the edge. It might be one more shovelful, but you're about to hit that rock. Keep on digging this morning. Keep on digging this morning until you hit that rock. Tell your neighbor I'm about to hit it. Uh, let me tell you something. When you hit rock, you know you're safe then, right? You know when you hit rock, you don't hit something that's firm, something that's solid, something that's immovable. It's when you hit the rock that's under your feet that you know then, I'm about to make it. I didn't think I was going to, but now I know I'm about to because I just heard the clanging of the shovel hitting the rock. And I know now that nothing can move my rock that's under my feet because my rock is Jesus Christ and he's never been moved before. Tell your neighbors, say, can't nothing move my rock. I'm telling you this morning, nothing's going to move my rock. 2 Samuel 22, 2 said, and he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Psalm 62, 6, David said, he is only my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Mm. One of the favorite verses, I just kind of said it, 42 of Psalm 40, verse 2 he brought me up also out of a horrible pit and out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Let me tell you something. It's when he puts you on the rock, beloved. But the only way you're going to get on the rock is you go to the Father first. And the only way to go through the Father is through the Son. I don't know about you today, but Jesus Christ is my rock today. And it was because I made a, a commitment to him one day. I said, Father, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. And I'll take everything away from me and firm me a firm foundation. Psalm 46, 1 and 3 said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will, uh, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. What David's saying right here is it doesn't matter what comes my way in life. It doesn't matter what comes my way in life anymore. I'm going to make it because nothing can move my feet off of my rock. Let me tell you something, there's going to be earthquakes that are going to come and they're going to shake you up. There's going to be tornadoes that come going to try to blow you over, beloved. They might be tsunamis that come in and hit you like a flood. Hurricanes, volcanoes, fires, floods, I don't know what it may be. But let me tell you something, as long as you're on a firm foundation, the Bible said, Jesus said when the storm came, there was one house that stood and there was one that didn't. I don't know where your house is this morning, but it better be on the rock of Jesus Christ because if it's not in the times we live in now, you'll get knocked off of that rock. I'm telling you right now, if it ain't the rock of Jesus, there's only one rock that we can stand on and it's Jesus Christ. Mm. Uh, you might be in the storm, but just keep digging. Uh, I'm not even concerned today if the storm you're in was your, your problem or your fault or not. You might could avoid it. You may not can. But what I'm asking you today is, is not if you caused it, not if, you, uh, if, if it was the point of the storm that you said, I, I could have went this way or that way. No, stuff is shaking around you, and you need help, and you need it right now. And let me tell you something. I got a shovel that I'm willing to give to somebody this morning that's willing to, just to take a little bit of that shaking a little bit longer, maybe a little bit this way, a little bit that way. I got a shovel that if you just dig, you'll get to the rock of Jesus. Because let me tell you something. David said, in Psalm 61 2 when not if but when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to that rock that is higher than I I don't know where you're being led today but don't be led astray I came to lead you to a rock that's higher than you ever thought 
The rock that's higher than the storm that you're going through. The rock that's higher than the fight that you're in and the battle you're in. The rock that's higher than the fire. I'm telling you, the flames can't touch you because the rock is higher. There's a rock that's higher than the enemy that's warring against you and trying to take you out. I'm telling you, you need to just start climbing up on the rock. Somebody needs to get on the rock this morning. I don't know where your rock is, but I'm telling you right now, I believe it's in the house of the Lord, and I believe his name is Jesus. Build your house on the rock today. Uh, let me just let me try to get you out of here. I don't want to keep you too long today. But I got to talk to you about the rock. I'm telling you, beloved, there ain't nothing like it when you fully get to that rock. Sometimes there's little pebbles along the way. Sometimes there's little uh, stones and then they become boulders. I don't know how many of you watched uh, The Curse of Oak Island. I'm, I'm kind of hooked on that. Little show right there. I like history and stuff. And <clears throat> excuse me, it talks about the Knights Templar and all this kind of stuff. And they're trying to find this rock. It's called the 90 foot rock. And this rock has supposedly got these subscriptions on them and all this stuff. And it's a fairly decent sized rock from what they're saying. In the last episode that they had, they're, they're digging in a yard trying to find this rock. And you hear the grinding and the scraping on the rocks. And they move a little bit of dirt back, and you see a bunch of little rocks, and they're moving my way, and there were some boulders. But every time I'd say, that ain't the rock. See, sometimes when we're digging, we think we're on the firm foundation of things. But it ain't the rock. When you get to the rock of Jesus Christ, you'll know it because life's transformation will happen in your life. If your life ain't being transformed, you ain't on the rock yet. You're just on some rock. When your life starts to be changed and you, be, you become that new creation that 2 Corinthians 5, 17 talks about, then you'll know that you're on the right rock. But if you're still doing the same thing you was doing before you found the rock, you ain't on the right rock yet. You on the pebbles. You're still on wobbly, shaky ground that can be moved out from up under your feet. Because when you get to the rock, there will be nothing that can move you. There will be nothing that can sway you. In Exodus 17, 6 and 7, it talks about the water that came out of the rock. And quenched the thirst of millions of people. One to three million is what they predict in Judges 6.21. It says the fire came up out of the rock and consumed Gideon's offer. In Job 29.7 he said the rock poured me out rivers of oil. In Psalms 81.16 he said he would satisfy with honey from the rock. In 1 Corinthians 10.4 it says there was a rock that followed the children of Israel all through their wilderness wandering. And then it says and the rock was Christ Jesus there's something about the rock that is able to follow you through every hell, storm, and high water that you go to. If you just look back, there's a rock trying to get you to come to him. And it's the rock of Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, that's the rock I'm talking about this morning. It's the same rock that Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the rock I came to lead you to today. That's the rock I came to tell you about today. It's the rock that never rolls. No, it's a foundation that never shifts. It's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's the captain in the time of the storm that never lost a battle. I'm telling you today, he's your fortress and your high tower. I don't know about you today, but you need the rock. Everything in your world could be shaking around you right now. The wind and the rain. And it's like nobody's going to help you. But there's one that will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's the rock of Jesus. If you'll step on the rock today, I'm not going to say there's not going to be storms that come your way. But if you'll step on that rock, mm, uh, you'll make it. You can make it. I can't promise them they were going to stop. But I can promise you that you won't be moved. You'll make it because nothing can move the rock. Beloved, this morning it's about Jesus. I read that thing the other day and me and my wife was kind of talking about it. and talking about some issues with it that I had. And this morning I happened to find an article about it and it said that, I don't know, like I say, if they, they stepped their church out or if they got kicked out. I don't know what happened there. They're not on a firm foundation. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. The Bible says you search the scriptures, for in them you find eternal life. Don't always listen to me. You search the scriptures I give you. You see how the Holy Spirit speaks to you on it. 
But there's men and women that are deceiving God's uh, deceiving God's people by misinterpreting God's word and 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 twisting and turning it to their own agenda. It's happening. They look. It ain't just the AG. The Methodist Church is doing it too. They done allowed it and voted it back in. They they could be in their pulpits too. It's not going to change, beloved. It's here. And there's going to be churches just like this. There may be few in number, but I'm telling you, we're going to be on the rock. We're going to be the rock. The Bible says the gate may be wide or narrow, but now only few going to enter that thing. Let me tell you something. I did a study on the gate one time. The gate's pretty wide, but it said only few going to enter that thing. Let me tell you something. There's going to be a day that comes. We're going to stand before the Lord for what we say. Don't be standing on the wrong rock. But Pastor Jennifer, come on up, please. I just want you to go ahead. This, this morning, just stand to your feet for a moment. Look at somebody and tell them. Ask them a question. Say, are you on the rock? Are you on the rock? Look, everywhere we turn, it's a shaky foundation. The government's shaking. The economy's shaking. The religious world is shaking. There ain't nothing stable anymore but Jesus Christ. The family structure is now shaking. We don't know who's mom and who's daddy anymore. You got men running for president kissing each other. Everything around us is shaking except the rock. You got to make it. It's my job to see that you do make it. That's why I ain't going to tickle your ears. You leave here mad. They'll be mad at the Holy Spirit. You got to make it, and I got to make sure you make it. Come hell or high water, you got to make it on my call anyway. Why? Because you made it to the rock. And let me tell you something, when you make it to the rock, nothing can shift you off of the rock. If you're building on what the world's telling you to build on, you're going to fall. If you're building on the world's economic system, you're going to fall. If you're counting on the government to take care of you, you're going to fall. If you count on social circuit, social security or welfare and all these things, you're going to fall. If you count on your ability to play the stock market, let me tell you, you will fall and crash. There's only one thing that you can depend on that has never failed. And his name is Jesus Christ and he's the rock of all ages. And if you build on any other foundation, the Bible says that you're a fool. Build your house today on the rock. Because nothing can move it. Amen. Bow your heads for just a moment. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you today. Lord, sometimes uh, I don't understand why you, you do what you do. I don't understand the words that you give me sometimes, Lord. But Father, in the end, I know that there's a purpose behind it. And Lord, today, if there's any in this room that that have not firmly put their feet upon that foundation, upon the, the solid rock, Jesus Christ. I'm asking you today, the Holy Spirit, to start to, to shake their hearts. We're the clay, Lord. You're the potter. I'm asking you, Lord, to start forming and shaping. Holy Spirit, move through who you need to move through this morning. God, may we rededicate our lives to you to to promise to build a firmer foundation, Lord, than what we already have. God, to seek your face more, to pray more, to read more, to, to listen more. God, I'm asking you today, Father, break our hearts for what breaks yours. This morning, if you're in this place and every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just going to ask you a question. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I have not built my house on that foundation you're talking about. But I dedicate myself today for me and my family and for the generations to come so if the Lord would tarry, I'm committing my life to that today. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. But before I ask that question to everybody in here, if you're here this morning and you say, I don't know the Lord as my Savior, or maybe you serve the Lord and you maybe went out and did some things your own way, but, but every time you go out and do it your way, the storms of life come in. And today you want to rededicate your life or accept Him for the first time as your Savior. And I'm about to count to three. 
And if that's you, I want you to lift your hand this morning. And we're going to come together and say a prayer in this place. Beloved, all I can say is this, with all that I have inside of me, I'm not trying to manipulate you in any way. But I have a purpose in my life. And that's to make sure that you know Jesus as your Savior. So if I got to shout a little bit, and I got to holler a little bit, I got to sweat a little bit, and I got to spit whatever I got to do, that's going to help you get to know him, then I'll do it all day long. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to rededicate my life or commit my life to the Lord for the first time, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to just simply lift your hand. Don't let nothing hold you back because the person beside you, in front of you, or behind you will not stand before the Lord with you. You'll be standing by yourself. So if that's you today, on the count of three, lift your hand. One, two, three, lift your hand. Anybody in this place this morning? Praise the Lord. All right. The second part of what I was going to say today is if you say, Pastor, I'll commit myself to building a firmer foundation for me and my family. Then today I just want you to lift your hands right where you're at. We're going to say a prayer.